Hey, Acts chapter 7 tonight. If you didn't see the class on ABD or Foundations tonight, it was quite something about heaven and hell. And uh, if you have a chance to take a look at that class because it was quite thought-provoking and quite motivating. I remember seeing that for the first time in Uganda in 1997. And uh, this is fresh then now as it was then. Acts chapter 7, we're going to look at the life of Moses for the next two classes and uh, consider seven aspects of why Moses received from God certain characteristics that made his life great. And I want you to think of some key chapters. If you look at them for the next couple of weeks, just take these chapters down. There's many chapters on Moses, but these are some great chapters to look into. Exodus chapter 2 and chapter 3. And obviously, the call of Moses from God and how he resisted and God persisted. And... Uh, that's chapters 4 and 5 and 6. Then, really, to me, it was an awesome display of God's greatness with the 10 plagues in Exodus 7 through 12. Then, the Passover and going out, going out of Egypt, Exodus 12 through 14. We'll look at Acts chapter 7 tonight, verses 20 through 44, deals specifically with Moses. Hebrews 11, 24 through 29. These are just passages for you to look at that reflect a lot of the characteristics of this man. Exodus 32 through 34, how Moses comes down from the mountain and deals with Israel in apostasy, how he's a friend of God in the 33rd chapter. We will go into some of these points and how God would lead him and then Deuteronomy 31 through 33, the charge of Joshua and the end of his life. So those are some great portions on Moses. We have a Thompson chain. They do a great job on the tree of life of Moses. And it really, really breaks his life down. I like to think of Moses' life as three 40s, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness with Jethro alone, and then 40 years back in the wilderness with the children of Israel. And uh, by the way, in the 40 years with the children of Israel in the wilderness is when much of the writing of the first five books of the Bible took place, maybe exclusive of Genesis, which might have been before. But Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and the next four books after Genesis, a lot of it took place in the plains of Moab and in the wilderness, the last year precisely. So God can take your wilderness experience and use it in a great way, Pastor Sturge. Although you, you, we don't even know you have a wilderness experience. You're so like right on with God. <laughs> hey. <laughs> okay. So the life of Moses. And um, I like to think of Moses as having f five, and by the way, the word exodus means the road out. I like that. The word exodus, as you look in the Hebrew and the Septuagint and the Greek, it's the road out. That's the best definition for exodus. And there was five exoduses that Moses had. By the way, what does Moses' name mean? Drawn out of water. So exodus is the road out. Moses is drawn out. That's kind of where his life begins, you know. Drawn out, wrote out. And uh, here's five different movements. He's put in an ark, and that's Exodus number one. He uh, escapes the wrath of Pharaoh. 
His second exodus is after he murders somebody, he kind of takes the road out into the wilderness. His third exodus is from the wilderness to Egypt. His fourth exodus is with the people of Israel back to the wilderness. And his fifth exodus is to heaven. So I just kind of put together five little movements there. The ark out of uh, danger from Pharaoh, killing all the firstborn. Then when he's 40 years old, into the wilderness, Exodus, the second one. Then an exodus from the wilderness to Egypt for a few days to bring the people out. Then an exodus from Egypt to the wilderness. And then the last one to heaven. So Moses and Exodus. Now, seven key principles. I'll give them to you now. We'll look at them for the next two classes, possibly. We shall see. Okay? Principle number one, he was a meek man, the meekness of Moses. Are you with me? Yeah. Thank you. It's good not, it's good not to be alone. <laughs> Sometimes you really actually think you are when you're up here. Uh, number two, faith, the faithfulness of God and the faith of a man. Faith. third principle of Moses is he was an eternal man. He understood the eternal. Fourth principle we'll look at is he was a, a man, we might say in our day and age, uh, a man of the body, but he was a man of God's people, Israel. Number five, he was a leadership man, a man of authority. Number six, he was a man who was a friend of God. And number seven, he was a man who had a call and a, an eternal purpose. Okay? So those are the seven things that we'll look at in regards to Moses. We will key on his meekness, faith, and how he understood that which was eternal his leadership, and a friend of God. So, are you with me? That's nice. Okay, let's look at Acts chapter 7. Let's read a few verses, and then we'll start with topic number one, what it means to be meek like Moses was, because he was said to be the meekest man above all men on the face of the earth. We really need to define that, too, because the principles of a godly man or a godly woman are totally opposite of what the world presents as the perfect man. Jesus Christ is the perfect man, obviously. But yet the world, how the world views a person and what the world's goal is for a man or a woman is totally contrary to God. Totally contrary. And yet being so infectious and so demonically initiated and inspired towards the church and towards people, people take on the characteristics of something other than a godly man or a godly woman. And they begin to think that that's the way it should be. Think about what men, like, uh, what men are like in this day and age and what they've been like down to history. And we have this idea that that is something that should be followed as an example when that's nothing at all like Jesus Christ. Nothing at all like Jesus Christ. So... Acts chapter 7, verse 20. Are you there? All right. In which time a father also blessed Pastor Chris Arman and Julie and the two kids as they go to Africa tonight on their way. Give them traveling mercies with those two children. Amen. 720. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was... Cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So he had some knowledge of who he was. He knew 
who his brethren were, and I really believe, without a doubt, he had an illumination that he was the deliverer. He, did, had, he had some aspect. John 16, 8 says, you have many, I have many things to say to you, to the disciples, that you cannot grasp. He had an illumination of what he was going to be called to do. Not exactly, not precisely, not where, when, or the details, but he just knew that there was something special about his life and that God was going to use him. Because later on he says, didn't you know that I'm, I, I, I'm supposed to be the person? And we'll see that. It came in his heart to visit the, his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffering wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Wrong move, but allowed by God. By the way, yeah, he tried to do in the flesh. He tried to perform his, his call in the flesh. All right? Do good in the flesh or do evil in the flesh. It's all flesh. It doesn't matter. For he supposed, and here's where I get that, that point on knowing with some illumination who he was. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. You see, even in Exodus chapter 2 and chapter 3, he, he, he had illumination that he was the deliverer. But isn't it great? Many, and that, isn't that about how God calls us? We go to Bible school and then it's defined and it's developed? Hello? Amen. Okay? He, don't you know I'm supposed to be the deliverer? But not that way, Moses. Maybe we would try to perform our call or live in our purpose. And we might have the purpose right, but we might be going about it all wrong. And he did. He went, he went about it in the flesh. He says, I'll take care of this guy. You know what happened. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Serge, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one to another? I, isn't that interesting? First of all, he breaks up a fight between a Hebrew and an Egyptian, and you know what happens there. And then he's, he tries to intervene with the Hebrew against the Hebrew. <laughs> but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Will you kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Wow. Didn't he look right and left and he, no one was looking? Huh? I read something today about Steve McNair uh, in an article and how a man was just talking about how uh, a woman put four bullets in him, was it? Two in his head and two in his chest. And she was a, a woman of another faith, 20-year-old woman that he was uh, having an affair with. And uh, we think about the great deeds. And they said he was born again, went to a Baptist church, and was really quite something. But you know what? Uh, think about how he will be remembered, sad to say, right? Then she killed herself. And he had hidden sin, secret sin that was controlling him for years. And by the way, it, it, it's always going to come out, whether it's pride, whether it's some area. Sometimes we think we're going to get away with it because time passes and nothing happens. But guess what? Be sure of this. Our sin will find us out. And one day, whether it's by some, some event, uh, some hindrance, something that happens health-wise or whatever, but uh, what it, my God, people know about me killing this Egyptian? Can't believe it. And then, Moses, then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Medean where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in the flame of fire in a bush. And Moses saw it. He wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and dare not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have seen, I like how he says this twice, I have seen, I have seen. Don't think I haven't seen. I have seen the affliction of my people. And by the way, God sees the affliction of his people. I don't care what's going on. 
I don't care how they're being persecuted, what's taking place in their lives, whether it's in China or it's in Islamic countries or it's in Indonesia or any place it is, God sees. And don't, don't worry about it. This life is short. God sees and God will take care of things one day. You heard the first class, right, what Dr. Stephen said tonight. They will be sent to hell. And in hell, they will have all their desires, all their lusts, all alone, and they will be tormented forever. So although people are getting away with it now, there will come a day. And when the 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Okay, we said that. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I have heard their groaning. Isn't that great? God hears your cries. Huh? Have you ever groan? You wonder, does anybody ever, ever listen? God hears. I hear their groaning, and I'm come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you into Egypt. I'm coming down to send you. It's <laughs> a good one. And this Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? This same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. And he brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. <laughs> you know what God did to Egypt in just a few days? He crippled the greatest empire on the face of the earth with 10 plagues. And it happened quick just in case any arrogant nation or group of nations thinks that they can do something. God can take a few days, it can take a week off, and just deal with an entire Europe or an entire America or an entire anything and just cripple it just like that. Matter of fact, it doesn't even take that long as it took in Egypt. The, the mightiest empire in the face of the earth, God crippled it just like that, one plague after another. It's incredible the authority, power of God himself. Where was I? What verse? 37? And this Moses, and this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church. Don't you like that? The church in the wilderness where the angel would speak to him in Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom after, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. That's an interesting statement, huh? Rejoicing in the works of your own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yes, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Remphon, figures which you made me to, made to worship them, and I will carry you away into Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Now, Numbers chapter 12. Of course, because of familiarity... It's amazing how these things start. Just We're going to talk about meekness first. It's really interesting. You have a mixed multitude coming with the nation of Israel in Numbers chapter 11. Who allowed them to come? I don't know. You know, whatever. They came. They were mumbling, grumbling, complaining, and all that kind of thing. And you wonder if, if Miriam and Aaron and Korah and all those people didn't just pick up that spirit. Because you can see a progressive thing taking place. Numbers 11, you see the mixed multitude. Numbers 12, you see Miriam and Aaron go against their brother. Numbers chapter 13, 
they say, ah, we're not going in. The giants, the land, the walled cities, we can't go in. Numbers chapter 14, 15, and 16 is continuous until Korah and company and all the 250 princes come right against Moses. And God opens up a hole in the ground and sends them directly to hell. All right, but you can, you can just watch how these things take place. And Moses, in the midst of it, was very meek. And we'll look at what that means. He was very meek and trusted God. Every time Moses was attacked, he hit the ground. Isn't that good? That means the attack went right at God. Every time they attacked him, he went down on his face. And Moses fell on his face. That's a great way. Instead of standing there and trying to uh, go against it and bring back human reason and talk and fight in your own strength, how about just hitting your face to the ground and saying, hmm, that's up to God. So Numbers chapter 12 the context is Miriam and Aaron, verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. Well, what business is it of theirs whom he married? Huh? Even his own sister and brother. It's none of your business. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Just like none of your business. That's, this is God's man, all right? because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, has the Lord, now what's this got to do with anything? Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Just because they don't like who he marries, now all of a sudden they're attacking God and Moses. Isn't that something? Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Oh boy. You know what? Like you just wish that maybe you could say something and God wouldn't hear it. God heard it. And then it says this, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Isn't that amazing? He was the meekest man on the face of the earth. More than anybody. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And the three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood at the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. There goes the dreams and vision people. Who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You know what happened. Leprosy for Miriam. Shut out of the camp. So, but I love the statement made about Moses. Moses was very meek above all the men upon the face of the earth. This is a great man, isn't it? This is a man who God is going to choose to be a real type of a, of a leader and a, even, a, even like representing Jesus Christ in Deuteronomy 18, 15. So let's think a little bit about this word meekness, all right? Meekness. The word for meekness in the Hebrew language is A-N-I, A-N-I. Sometimes it appears as A-N-A-W. And this word for meekness means someone who is a receiver, someone who has a dependency upon God, someone who does not resist. He does not resist. She does not resist. They depend upon God in their position and for their position. In the New Testament Greek, prautes, P-R-A-U-T-E-S. P-R-A-U-T-E-S. And it means one who also is a receiver and an acceptor of the character and ability of God. So this is what meekness is all about. One who is a receiver. He depends upon God. She depends upon God. They do not resist. They accept everything coming from God. And if not, sometimes they get, people get confused. But God allows things to happen in a plan. So he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Above all men on the face of the earth. This was one of the great characteristics. But that's not a characteristic of the kind of people that we see today. Now look with me at Isaiah chapter 66. 
I mean, everybody wants their picture in the newspaper. Everybody wants, uh, they've got big posters, come to the meeting of the healer. In Africa, you see it. They don't even talk about Jesus. There's these huge posters with somebody proclaiming themselves to be a healer. And you, you see, people that are in authority on our planet, there's no meekness. There's no meekness. Oh, there might be a few here and there with a little bit of a characteristic of it. But overall, I'm talking overall about world leaders. Can you imagine if they had the character of Moses? He was the meekest man. He's the man with all the authority from God because he's the meekest. The man who gets authority from God is the one who's meek. The man who gets authority from the devil is the one who's proud. How's that one? That, could, that says a lot, doesn't it? The proud man has authority from Satan and his kingdom because Satan knows how to penetrate the old sin nature, which is proud. So a proud devil with a proud demonic initiation hits a proud old sin nature to build a proud world. Did you get that? That is not God's world. It's not God's world. And remember, meekness means somebody who's accepting and receiving and not resisting God. Don't, go, don't tell me about people that you say are, are meek and humble just because they're quiet and they seem to be like nice people and they, ha, you know, they, they seem to like, oh, he's one of the guys, you know, or something like that. That doesn't mean they're meek. Meekness is an absolute relationship to God, a relationship to God. Without a doubt, a relationship to God, not resisting, but accepting from God's nature and character with a provision from God and depending upon God. And depending upon God. Isaiah 66. So we think about this, this uh, thought on meekness because really this is very important. And Jesus, what did Jesus say he was in John 11? I mean, in Matthew 11. 28 through 30. What did he say he was? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am, I am what? I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest for your soul. The God man was meek. The greatest, most, the perfect man was absolutely meek. And this is really what God would say how men ought to be, how women ought to be, how husbands ought to be, how pastors ought to be, how people in authority ought to be, how governmental leaders ought to be. But this meekness, you don't find it. You don't find it. It's, it's kind of like a lost characteristic in this arrogant day and age, even in churches, even in churches. So Isaiah 66 he gives three characteristics of somebody that he will fellowship with. God says, what are you trying to do, build me a house? What do I care about your, your adventure and your uh, plan and your desire and your uh, you know, life work of trying to build me a house? What do I care about that? Isaiah 66, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that will you will build unto me? What are you going to do for me? And where is the place of my rest? What are, you, what are you trying to do? Heaven is my throne. Earth is what I put my feet on. What are you going to do? What would you like to do? Huh? To be somebody. What do you want to do? And this is what he said. I love this verse. For all these things have my hand made, and all these things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. He says, I'm looking for a person. Okay? I'm looking to dwell in this person. Rather than you build me a house, I want to be in your house. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the man to whom I look. He that is poor, and by the way, that's the word ani. It's, it's better translated meek. He that is meek, it's the ani or the anwa man. And this is the person, this is the Hebrew translation there. He that is poor and of a contrite spirit a broken person, and he that trembles at my word. It's 
amazing. Imagine those three characteristics. God says, these are the characteristics of the person that I look to dwell in. Rather than you trying to build me a house to dwell in, I'm looking to dwell in people. And these are the kind of, only kind of people I can dwell in. The poor, the humble, the poor, the broken, and those who tremble at my word. This is amazing, isn't it? And he says, oh, you know, Moses, yeah, yeah, maybe you, maybe you did this, maybe you did that. Maybe he had a bad temper. He did. He got a little angry once in a while, remember? He struck the rock, killed an Egyptian. Remember what he did to the Jews when he came? Remember what he did to Israel when he came down, when they had made a golden calf? Huh? Did you ever read that one? He ground the calf up, and he made him drink it. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? They ground that golden calf up into powder, and he made him drink it. Wow, oh, I think he was a little upset. <laughs> By the way, the definition of meekness is not, Praise the Lord. I just love everybody. I would, I would never make a whip and drive wicked people out of the temple. I think we should love everybody. We should allow women preachers and homosexuals and lesbians. We should allow them because we, God is just so, you jerk. That's a jerk, a spiritual demonic jerk. I, uh, that, that's, that's what? That's voluntary will worship. That is meekness and that is a, a humility and a meekness that's not from God. That's not from God. I mean, I, I, read, I, I told you before, I read Wormbrandt's little thought. He said, do you know that Jesus actually sat there and made a whip? He didn't just like grab somebody's whip. He sat there and was making that whip to drive people at scourge, to drive people out of the temple. That's also meekness. He's, meekness means I am going to be a receiver and I'm going to depend and I'm going to accept whatever God brings. This is meekness. This is meekness. But yet we have this, this whole idea about what meekness is today. And this is really what God is looking for. You don't find this in the world. Somebody who says, I do, I'm depending upon God. I'm going to accept whatever God says. I'm, going to not, I'm not going to resist God. I'm going to be a receiver of God's life. And this is what Moses was all about. It doesn't mean that you won't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that things will not happen in our lives where we will fail and we will fall down but get back up. But this is the characteristic of a great man of the Bible. He was meek. He was very meek above all the men on the face of the earth. And that's why God said, here's a man who's going to listen to me. Here's, going, here's a man who's going to receive from me. Here's a man who's going to accept whatever takes place. Even when I tell him, after all those years, you're not going into the promised land. How would you like to put up with those people for 40 years in the wilderness, and then you're told, not going in? Wow. He just said, here we go. Actually, he, did, he had a better deal. He went up instead of going in, which I think is not a bad deal. Okay? He went up instead of not going in. So, meekness. James chapter 1, and I love James 1, 19 through 21. And if you connect it with 2 Timothy 2, 25, first of all, the believer is to receive with meekness the implanted word which can deliver their soul. James 1, 19 to 21. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which can deliver your soul. And then in 2 Timothy 2, 25, Paul says to Timothy, I want you to instruct people and teach people with meekness. So you receive the word, meekness receives the word, and meekness teaches the word and instructs in the word. And that means sometimes saying things that are not always going to be the most popular things to say. And that means for me also receiving things from God that maybe I, I would rather not hear it. I don't want to even be bothered with it. It's not an area I would like to have proclaimed too often. I mean, just listening to that, that whole thing on hell and, and, and judgment tonight, tonight from Pastor Stevens' uh, Romans chapter 2 class. You know, I'm just thinking to myself, wow. I was reading something from Hudson Taylor, a uh, spiritual secret book that we're reading for the book of Acts. And he said, can you imagine all the trivialities and things that Christians are dealing with? And he says that 
2 million people a month are going to hell in China without anybody to tell them about Christ. And here, why would you take my parking place? How come you sat down in that seat? That's my seat every week in Bible school. Why is it that I got this grade? How come I was marked absent when I was just a little bit late? How come that sandwich cost $6.12? I thought it should have been like $4.40. And, and what, what's going on over there? And how come the electricity went up? And what about the, the well, that rent, really? And how come, how come you, you cut me off the road, you know? And what's going on here? You call that cooked? That food's not cooked. That doesn't look like it's correct at all. I was in the hospital with my dad uh, two days, for two days. And um, I thought, okay, I'm going to sit here. And I wasn't really keen about maybe how things were taking place. But I prayed. I said, God, give me a, a heart and, uh, for these people that are working here that I could. I'm here in this hospital to tell people about Christ, not just to visit my father. So the new shift came on, and there was, can you believe this? My father was given two Ghanaian nurses. <laughs> I mean, it was like shocking to them. I just started talking to them all about Africa and Ghana, and they were like, they couldn't believe it. Like, tell us more. I said, you, I'll tell you more, but are you born again? Are you saved? We're saved. I said, take care of this old man. <laughs> I didn't mean me. I meant my father. <laughs> you, you take care of him. You take care of him. It was just really a great fellowship. Then I met this woman, very difficult woman. My brother had a most incredible time with her. She was just giving a very hard time about care and nursing home and I mean it's so complicated the whole system so I walked up to her I said excuse me man could I just spend about five minutes with you in your office Could I just sit down and talk to you said, yes and I said like this is what we believe this is what my father's like and I'm so thankful that you work here because I know you're really going to listen to what I have to say and it was amazing she was just so she was so moldable and she was so kind and she did so much and my father came home today she did so much to get him there and everything and you know what I thought I could like get upset with her because of maybe some of the things that have taken place or she's tried to do or maybe I could just with meekness talk to her and trust God to turn her heart are you with me hmm he was meek well uh, the leadership he was there was meekness so Paul says to Timothy instruct people in meekness when you instruct people you don't put yourself above people you don't put yourself in this way like, you know what you do, or you do that, you do this, and you do that, you should do this. Why? I think we, we look at the Bible first. We don't talk down at people. We are actually sitting lower than they are and receiving from God. And so you receive it in meekness, and then you teach people in meekness. This is really what Christianity is all about. I come to church, I come to Bible school, and I'm not going to resist what's being said even if I don't like it. I may not like it. Are you supposed to like everything? Huh? Jeez, was he talking about me? By the way, you know, some people are very arrogant. You know why? They think you would spend a whole message on them, and there's a thousand people there. I, I, was, I, I preached to 3,000 people in Ghana one time, and a guy came to me and says, why are you talking about me? I said, well, I'm going to talk to you right now. You're arrogant. To think I would spend the message on you when there's 2,999 other people here, and I'm directing one message to you, that's pretty interesting for me as a pastor to do, isn't it? Maybe you got convicted by the Holy Spirit. Huh? So I'm going to be a receiver. I'm going to be a receiver. I'm telling you, I remember in the early days, in 1976 and 77, I would hear Dr. Stevens saying some things, and I would want, you know, Pastor Serge, I would like to just go underneath the desk and, and, and try to block my ears and scream, what's he talking about? Why is he? I mean, he was like so dogmatic on things. By the way, some people that just don't like people that are dogmatic with convictions, you know why? They, they just want something soft-spoken, something nice. Don't ruffle my feathers. Don't you ever say something that would wound my flesh. No, I'd like to say something that would kill your flesh. <laughs> Not wound it. Lovingly, though. But meekness does what? Meekness receives. And the Bible says in Psalm 25, verse 9, the meek shall he teach. He cannot teach a person that's not meek. If I'm not meek, I am not accepting. I am, not, uh, I am resisting God's word because meekness is always related to the word. 
It's always related to the word. Why did God give Moses the first five books of the Bible and the Ten Commandments and all those, all those other uh, injunctions he gave him? Because Moses was meek and Moses would receive it. And he would receive it even at the expense of his own flesh. So meekness is the key. It's something that you do not find in Christianity today much. I'm not saying here, I'm just saying. Overall, and overall Christianity, everybody wants, uh, 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 I'm preaching this week. Why are, how come I'm not teaching in Bible school? What about the seminar? How come I don't do the seminar, you know? I remember one time I was going, uh, I was traveling in a certain country, and a man came to me and said to me, he said, God has spoken to me that I, now I've been living in this country for years, okay? And what that means, just ministering, planting churches. We had like about 10 or 12 churches there. He says, God told me that I should be the conference speaker. I thought, hmm. Jeez, I wonder why God didn't tell me. Since I'm, <laughs> since I'm the pastor, you'd think that maybe he would have at least given me some idea. But I saw that this meant a lot to this guy. Now, right or wrong. I said, yeah, fine. Okay. We'll, we'll do this together, you know, because I, I realized that. And then when he, he left the country, by the way, he had spent three years in this country. I mean, three weeks. You know what you are after three weeks in the country? An amateur tourist. <laughs> M, missionary, ATM missionary. <laughs> no, no, nothing against it. You should go for three weeks or two weeks, wherever you are. But... He gave me a list of 30 things I needed to do to make the church more effective. So in three weeks, he was able to figure that one out. And I said, thank you for the letter. No, I just burned it. <laughs> I mean, it was like Pastor Stevens came to Ghana and never did that. He came and never mentioned like one thing I should do or not do. He just came and he said to me, what should I preach about? like pastor you're my pastor what are you asking me that for because what do you think i should preach about what's the thing that's most i said i don't have any idea i would never tell you what to preach about that's like i would never even get on that ground you know he was he was amazingly meek he was a, he was a meek man that's why god gave him so much spiritual authority that's, and, and, and when by the way when people want that spiritual authority without meekness god shuts him off shuts him down cuts him out and says goodbye. Catch you later. Meekness. Moses was meek. He had to be. Because he had to be receiving from God. Because he wasn't receiving much from Israel. They were not really helping him out a whole lot. You know, they were, there was, remember a couple times he wanted to just say, I've had enough. By the way, he said, why don't you kill me? He got very discouraged. He said, I think, I'll, I, could I do something else? Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. When we restore people, we do it with what? Meekness. In other words, I go to a person that's failed or is living in sin, and I go and, and I put myself in the place that, you know what? This is me. I don't say this could be me. I have an old sin nature, correct? So if I'm going to draw them and say, why did you do that? How come you did that? Don't you know any better? What's wrong with you? Living in, in that sin, doing that. That's God's. No, no, no. Like. That's not the way you restore somebody. You do it with what? Meekness. You that are spiritual, do it with what? Meekness. Meekness. A key thing. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Meekness is a key to keeping unity. Keeping unity. Meekness. David was a meek man. He, yes, he would... He would be a great warrior. And by the way, meekness would fight Goliath. Why? Because Goliath, because David, God would say to David, go against Goliath. And meekness would say, I accept that. I will not resist that. I will be a receiver of your word. This is a great, this is a great man of God, one who's a receiver. And that means I come to church. I, I come and I'm and I'm a receiver. I'm a receiver. I'm going to accept what comes. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to show me 
uh, wh where it is in, in the messages and, in, and, and what's taking place in relationships as far as spirituality is concerned. And just be a receiver from God. This man was a very great man above all. He was meek above all the men on the face of the earth. And this is a person that God can exalt. You know, what happens a lot of times when people get a lot of Bible knowledge, they like to try to choke people to death with it. I used to notice that sometimes when we had Bible school overseas, you know. A person would come flying out after one year, and they go soul winning, and they get somebody against a tree, and they, they would preach everything they knew, everything they knew about everything to that poor person sitting there going, you know, <laughs> verses and all that. Like, that's not meekness. That's not meekness. That's just trying to show off how much you know. That's not meekness at all. So great verses on meekness. First Peter chapter 3, verse 4. The hidden man of the heart. A meekness. Psalm 37, verse 11. Matthew 5, 5. Matthew 21, 5. How did Jesus enter Jerusalem? Sitting on a, on a colt, right? He came in in meekness. He came in in meekness. And what does it mean to be a lamb? What do you think about a lamb? Remember that story I told you? I had this, I, I preached this message one time about a, a, a fight between, a, uh, two, between two different creatures. And I said, I want you to see the stadium full like it was when Muhammad Ali fought Joe Frazier in Zaire, the Congo. And there was just millions of people there. And I want you to picture that there's this huge... Ten-headed, seven heads, ten horns, whatever it is, dragon in the middle of the ring. Fire-breathing, huge, and in walks a little lamb. Which one would you bet on? In reality, you saw there was a great dragon and a little lamb. Which one would you say would be the winner in the natural? You say the dragon. But it's a lamb who defeated a dragon. He's the lamb of God. And I love it. Like Jesus is called the lamb. Um, interestingly enough, there's two different Greek words for the word lamb. Whenever the word lamb is used in the Gospels and in the epistles, it's the word amnos, A-M-N-O-S, which means sacrificial one and meek one and lowly one. But when it's used in Revelation, it's arneon, which means authority and majesty and power. It's a whole different word that's used something like 20 times or 27 times in the book of Revelation. The lamb. But it's a different word than the gospel lamb. But you see, Jesus was meek. You know, are you the son of God? You say that I am. Are you the king of Israel? You say that I am. And you, you know what they did to him, how they just bound him and led him away as a lamb to the slaughter? He was totally meek. Meekness. And this is an amazing characteristic of Moses and God help us to grow in this because this is so important as far as greatness is absolutely connected to meek the second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1 turn there we'll take a little break in a minute second Corinthians chapter 10 Paul is coming to a group of people in Corinth who reject his apostolic authority and he's the very one that planted the church isn't that wonderful you think you've ever, ever had a difficult time Imagine you plant the church in Corinth and then they're they are abusing and accusing you and will not receive you as a man of God. And what does Paul say in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 10? Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. So he says, I am meek. But do not, do not think that meekness wipes out being bold and having courage. Because certainly Jesus had that. There was boldness. I mean, have, have, you ever, have you ever read Matthew 23? That's a crazy question for Bible college students. Have you ever read that? Did you ever wonder how, how Jesus attacked the Pharisees? Was he still meek when he did that? Yes, he was receiving from God. Sometimes he would be looked at and somebody would say, that's not meekness because their idea of meekness has to do with the human meekness, the world's meekness, when it's simply accepting and receiving 
everything from God, his word and the purpose and the plan, and not resisting. And so Jesus went right at them knowing what was going to take place, knowing how angry they would be. He went right at them. How many woes did he pronounce against them? Eight or nine, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, whitewashed sepulchers, serpents, snakes. I mean, I mean, he, he, was, he, didn't, pull, he didn't hold back anything, did he? Was he still meek and lowly when he did it? Are you sure? Yes, he was. With that, if you were watching that, standing there watching that, what would you have said? Now, Jesus, you ought to be a little bit more humble and meek and more godlike. <laughs> right? Incredible. They say in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that Erasmus, the great Bible commentator of years ago, old school commentator, he was good. He said, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, thundered out against the, the Corinthians. They said his message was, he was angry. Let me just show it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Just turn there for a minute. He said it was all in the imperative. All, it was all with an aggressiveness against them. And he mocked them. He was actually mocking and ridiculing them. And Erasmus says this was one of the greatest passages uh, that was ever issue, issued out from a man of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He's talking about, you can't even, I can't judge myself, how can you judge me? Okay. Now look at verse 8. This is, he, Erasmus says he is so sarcastic here towards them. But Paul was meek. They needed this kind of a thing. And God wanted them to hear it this way. I'd love to preach on this portion someday. I think I did once in my life. Such, a, such an incredible portion. He goes, now you are full. Now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign that we might also reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. Hmm, how about this? this is how he's saying it too. The way I'm saying it, I studied this extensively, and this is how he's saying it. We are fools for Christ's sakes, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so strong. You are honorable. We are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no dwelling, certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He just went, he went right at them. And he was meek. He was meek. But he went right at them. He received this from the Holy Spirit, and he addressed them. So, Father, bless our break in the second half of class. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.